Hi, ich wollte nur mal kurz sagen, dieser Podcast hat jetzt auch einen Newsletter, damit du keine Folge mal so aus Versehen verpasst und damit du mitbekommst, wenn es eine Aktion oder ein Special rund um Binweg Bouldern gibt. Den Newsletter, den findest du auf meiner Steady-Seite, das ist steadyhq.com slash binwegbouldern und natürlich auch auf binwegbouldern.de. Das war's, viel Spaß mit dieser Folge. It's kind of the last chance for the athletes to qualify. So people like Adam Ondra, you know, Stasha Geo, for example, you know, they'll be trying to get in. And for me, they're the ones to keep an eye on. And maybe we won't have the consistency that we saw last year, but it's truly make or break time for so many of them. So it's going to be exciting like that. Hi and welcome to episode 144 of Binweg Bouldern. My name is Juliane Fritz and my guest is Matt Groom. I guess you know his voice, you know his face, he had been a show host at Epic TV for a very long time and he is the commentator of the IFSC live streams, he is a climbing filmmaker and much more. As the new IFSC World Cup season is about to start, I wanted him to be the person to talk about the new season here in the podcast. We chatted about his work as a commentator, we looked at the last season because I needed to catch up a little with what was going on last season as a young mother. I did not have the time to watch all the World Cups. And of course, we are looking at the new season, what is important in the international comp climbing scene in 2024. Thank you, Matt, for taking the time. And now have fun with this interview. Hello, Matt. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm happy to talk to you. Well, you are, but I'm very snotty and sniffy today. So apologies if I sound gross. But I am a bit gross. Ooh. But you, you have to deal with that. Get worse soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, um, besides being a little bit sick, how are you right now? What keeps you busy these days so shortly before the season? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, as you say, it's before the IFSC season. But uh, this year I've been asked to do the UIAA ice climbing season. So... We're almost finished with that now. We've had three events that I've done, uh, and then the final event is in Canada in a couple of weeks. I've been doing that, and then also sort of in the last phases of a real rock film that is going to come out uh, next Friday, so on the 16th of February. So deeply involved with the sort of production elements of that and, and uh, getting everything sorted for that. So it's been a, been a busy period of time. Yeah, I believe. Uh, yeah, the, the movie is about the Ukrainian uh, climbers, right? Yes, it is. I'm not going to give away too much stuff uh, because it hasn't been released and I want people to go and see it. But uh, yes, it's about Ukraine. It's about Ukrainian climbers. And I, uh, I traveled to Ukraine to spend time with them. Very excited about the film. And that will be coming out yeah, next, next Friday, which is terrifying, <laughs> to be honest with you. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing that. You must be so busy. I mean, the IFSC calendar is really full. Now there's ice climbing. Then you still have your job at Epic TV and you do other productions, as you said right now. I mean, the thing is, your face is presenting climbing all the time. <laughs> do you have time to reflect that? <laughs> um, well, the Epic TV stuff, I've, I've kind of stepped back from, actually. So that's the... Uh, in, in fact, I don't really work for them anymore. So... Although I will be doing the occasional project with them, if there's a, so for example, I've got a competition in a few weeks time in the UK and I'll be filming a, a video sort of for Epic TV as part of that process. But generally I'm, I'm not working for them anymore. So that is one thing that I've, that I've managed to, to save a little bit of time on. Mm. Yeah. I haven't seen you there for, for a while, but I did not know that you really stepped back. Okay. Yes, no one's really talked about it, which is a bit strange. But um, <laughs> yes, I have kind of stepped back from it. I used to, I mean, throughout the last couple of years, I've sort of moved away slowly. And the last thing I was really doing was the gear shows for them. And I was editing and sort of producing those. But yeah, the last, last two months, I've stopped doing that. And as I say, now it's just the occasional big project. So I went and did a, a shoot at Mont Blanc with some athletes. In the summer, for example, I shot uh, Jakob Schubert on Alfane. So There might be stuff that crops up every now and again, but um, I think the show is sort of going in a, in a different direction for next year. And yeah, I'm excited to see what they do. But yeah, not, I'm not really part of that anymore. But still, how weird is it to like be on the camera all the time? Everyone knows your face. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm the classic example of, of someone who's very, very shy in, in real life and far more comfortable on a camera. So if you were 
to put me in front of a thousand people and ask me to speak, I would feel pretty much at home. But if you send me into a party by myself, I would be very lost. So um, for me, being on camera and doing those things is sort of a comfort zone for me. I love being on camera. I love speaking to people. And it's not too strange for me, especially at this point. I've kind of got used to it by now. Okay. Well, I understand that really well. <laughs> What <do> you say? <laughs> um, I want to speak to you about the new season, but also about what happened last season. I need you to help me to understand the last season because I could not watch too many oh, I see. competitions. I see. And I have uh, questions about the World Championships in Bern. First, yes. Okay. And, uh, I just want to. I just want to say before we, we you, you start delving into next year that is that my memory for competitions is very very short, and I know that sounds ridiculous, but for me, I think because I'm so involved in it that when it finishes, it's almost like a, it leaves my brain, and I have to work really hard to get the memories back. Um, so if I make some mistakes, it's because I'm an idiot, but also because I just get sort of swept up in the moment sometimes. So just to, you know, let your viewers know. That I understand that. I mean, it's really, it's so much. <laughs> yes. And there were a lot of events last year. But so let's I'll do see what we can find in your brain. <laughs> yes. Okay. Last year, we had the World Championships in Bern. That was an event with lead, speed, bouldering, paraclimbing, and the new Olympic format, which is boulder and lead. And you were there all the time. And at first, to me, it is impressive how you talk to all these events. I only did this job for short events that lasted for two days, the uh, German championships. And these two days were really enough for me. What is it like to do this commentating job for two weeks? Yeah, it was very intense. It, it was generally quite an intense two weeks because not only did we do i think it was something like 32 hours of broadcast over that period of time uh we were also producing a daily show for the ifsc youtube and that included highlights that included extra content and material and i was trying to direct the end of this real rock shoot it was a very 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 busy time but i mean to be honest the, the almost the easiest part of my job is when is when we go live because at that moment there's no extraneous things going on it's just climbing and what we're saying and it almost it almost feels calmer sometimes you just get swept up in the moment it, it was exhausting and i think the hardest thing is to to finish a full day and then go back to a hotel late at night and get up early in the morning and do it all again the next day it becomes a bit groundhog day but i mean what a privilege eh? i get the best seat in the house and i get to see some mm. incredible athletes so it's it's never too hard And you always have really good um, co-commentators. I mean, you were talking with Shauna Coxey a lot, and she was really good. <laughs> Shauna was very good. Yeah, we have some things planned for this season, some kind of the bigger events Ooh. that uh, Shauna will be part of. Um, ah, you have to tell me more about that when we talk about the next season. <laughs> <this> season. <laughs> so yeah, it was it was very nice to have Shauna there, and I got to spend the entire time with her. You know, it's nice to settle in with somebody because you have to build that rapport. And it was the same in Laval with the uh, with the European qualifier. So it certainly makes it easier. And obviously, Shauna is a pro and she's mm -hmm. very experienced both on the media and, and the climbing world. So she made it easy. Yeah. And um, when you think about Bern, what were your favorite moments there? Oh, there were so many. Um, watching Mikel Mawem win was pretty special uh, on the outrageous no friction holds which i had predicted i just want to say this i had predicted that this was the way that setters were going to go um but it was a pretty wild uh final boulder and it was just awesome to see someone like that win and the passion he brought to it jakob schubert qualifying and winning the lead was pretty special i mean jakob is a is a one of my favorites just because he's a really lovely guy i've known him a long time and i think he's a legend so to see him qualify again was very very special mm. um Watching Yanya Gambrett qualify for the Olympics was very special because I think, you know, there are certain athletes and I think of people like Ola Miroslav for the speed that you sort of, you hope they get in because they're such, they're favorites and they're exciting to watch, but you never know. So seeing her qualify was, was special as well. Mm. And what were like the most exhausting moments for you personally? <laughs> I think in terms of exhaustion, the, the paraclimbing finals always sort of hits that note because it's much longer than the other competitions. I think we speak for about four and a half hours. And obviously you put in the same amount of energy into that as you do any comp. But it's that kind of energy, but over four and a half hours. And yeah, so that one I think is always the most exhausting. 
because I care about it hugely as well. So I, I always want to do a good job for the athletes and for the people watching. And yeah, it's just the length of time for that one is a big one. So that was tiring. Mm. Yeah, uh, I was thinking about my experience with uh, commentating um, uh, here in Germany. And I once had a moment uh, commentating the German championships where I was completely out of energy. I switched to autopilot and I only produced somehow good sounding standard sentences. <laughs> and I was commentating together with Jule Wurm. And she later said about that moment, how did you do that? You just kept talking. I could not say anything anymore. And I thought, <laughs> okay, wow, it sounded authentic, <laughs> but it was definitely <laughs> not. I was just spitting out words that maybe fitted to the scene do you know these moments does that happen to you and when um so far i've yet to run out of something to say which is good um but for sure there's moments when you know your energy isn't necessarily there and i think the the temptation is then to sort of over overcompensate for it and super hype yourself up And sometimes you just have to trust it. You know, they're, they're long broadcasts and I think that people follow along as well. If you, if you have a sort of a, an incredibly high energy level throughout the entire thing, then, you know, people get bored of listening to a sort of a hyped human being. So I think it's okay to have ups and downs. Yeah, so far that hasn't happened to me, to be honest. Like I get tired, but I try to push through. So at the, at the moment it's okay, but um, I'll let you know if that happens. But so far it's all right. <laughs> Do you have any tricks to keep your energy level up? So anything you eat or taking a nap or something, what do you do? Yeah, generally my diet is incredibly unhealthy during competitions. Uh, it, it tends to be sugar based. So if a competition has Red Bull, then that is what I'll be drinking uh, for sure. I try not to go into it hungry, so I try to eat before. And also, it's usually such a late night when we finish, I don't get a chance to eat afterwards. So eating before is pretty helpful. But yeah, I'll just, I have no sort of healthy tricks of sort of cucumber mm. water and all of that. I just tend to smash a Red Bull, have many, many, many coffees and try to maintain it like that. It's, it's going to kill me for sure, but it's worth it, I think. And after the comp, you do just one week of eating like fresh food and salad or something? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's a funny one. I think life on the road is generally quite difficult to stay healthy. I try my best and there are some competitions where I'm better than others at that. But, you know, hotel food, late night places, you know, like supermarket food, you, you do have to make quite an effort. And sometimes I get it right and sometimes I get it wrong. But yes, when I come home, it's sort of back to home cooking and no more meals out for sure. Uh, I mean, it's the same problem that athletes have the competitions yes the thing is that their entire job is to sort of stay healthy uh whereas my job is just to stay energized enough to be on camera so you know if i go and have a sort of a, a bag of sweets it's not going to affect my performance on the wall but it might keep my energy up so i, I think mm -hmm. that's the difference between me and an athlete yeah here comes a short break If you like this podcast, you can support my work for Binweg Burdan. There's a crowdfunding on the platform Steady. Thank you to all the people that support me there. This constant help gives me the possibility to keep this podcast going. If you need more information, go to steadyhq.com or find all the links to the Steady crowdfunding on my website, on my Instagram channel, and of course, in the show notes of this podcast episode. Thank you very much. And now let's go on with the interview. I need some more information about the last season because, well, I told you, I became a mom. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I don't have so much time anymore to watch everything. I mean, there were years when I really watched everything yeah so and last season i was happy to watch a few finals and before this season i was i would just like to know what i missed what is maybe important to know to mm -hmm. like keep up this year so what were the epic competition moments for you last year Oh, I mean, I think I think talking in a general sense we're seeing this sort of transition between old school and new school comp climbers at the moment There are certain athletes who are dropping out. You know, I'm thinking of people like Yane Kruder or Jan Hoyer, for example. You know, there's athletes who are moving away from the scene. And then you get these athletes who are still in it. You know, people like Adam Ondra and Jakob Schuber and Helene Janiko, who's come in and out. And now she's back, you know. And then you get the very, very, very young kids. People like Annie Sanders, who was, you know, 16 when she was competing. And it's been fascinating to watch that and this transition. 
throughout the season. So I think that's certainly an important one uh, to pay attention to. And then, you know, there's been certain legendary figures. I mean, you know, Yanya Garnbrett last year with her comeback, she broke her toe at the beginning of the season and we weren't quite sure what form she would be in, especially on a slab. So watching her sort of return and then not win the first competition and then fight her way back to the top spot, that was very, very special. And of course, the Olympics has been the big focus of this year and seeing which athletes can handle the pressure. Comp climbing is always pressurised, but this year with the qualification, I can't even imagine how much those athletes had on their shoulders. So, you know, watching certain athletes not make it when you'd expect them to and having to go away and retrain. I'm talking, you know, everyone was talking about Toby Roberts for sure. He was going to qualify and then he didn't in the world champs and he had to sort of go away and reassess and then came back and qualified. That was, that was cool to see him do that. So yeah, those are a couple of talking points, I guess. Yeah. Toby Roberts is a person that I, I did not see him qualifying, but I like saw in social media people talking about him. Okay, yes. I guess I have to rewatch that. <laughs> uh, you should go to Laval and have a look at that one. And Brixen as well, because his fight to win his uh, Boulder Gold in Brixen was incredible. Okay. I heard a lot about Brixen too, that uh, people just liked um, the venue there. Yes, it's cool. It, it was a new one. It was brought in due to COVID restrictions one year, sort of at, at, at the last minute. And it turns out that everyone loves it. And it's a, it's a very cool venue. It's like an amphitheater. The stage is protected from the, from the weather and from the sun, which is important, although the audience bake in the sun outside. But it's a nice it's a nice place. It's a cool sort of town, which I would never would have gone to right on the edge of the Austrian border in Italy. And also it sort of makes it up part of the circuit where we go to Brixen and then we continue on to Innsbruck. So it feels like a bit of a, a journey for everyone, which mm. is quite nice. But there's no World Cup in Brixen this year, right? God, is there not? Oh, no. Okay, I, I'm going to bring it up. I'm looking now. Maybe you're right. They have dropped quite a few this year. Yeah, I don't think there is. No, no Brixen. I mean, I think they've had to make certain decisions this year due to the, the Olympics and the OQS mm. series. So whereas last year we had so many events this year, I think it's about half the amount. So it was, uh, it's different this year. Yeah. I just ask some questions to see what is left there in your brain. <laughs> <laughs> What were surprising moments last season or unexpected things? Oh, that's a good question. I, th I mean, I always think it's interesting, especially at the beginning of the season, to see who's come on during the off season. People like, for example, Mejdi Schalk, you know, watching him in the first couple of comps get gold medals was not a surprise, but he, he really found something different in the off season. I found a maturity that he hadn't had before. He had the skill, obviously, but... Putting together the mental game was something he hadn't quite done. So him finding that and coming into the new season so strongly was pretty incredible to watch. God, what other surprises do we have? I mean, there's probably so, so many surprises. Um, I mean, it was there's nothing really that's just like totally shocking to me. I think it was very interesting how the competitions were won by lots of people. Actually, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a surprising moment for me was Miho Nanaka winning gold in Seoul because... I had no idea that it was her first boulder gold in five years. I just didn't realize that. And that was shocking because to me, she's always winning gold. So to discover that sort of on air as well and, and realizing that maybe my research isn't as good as I thought it was, that was quite interesting. So um, awesome for Miho and yeah, a surprise and, and for her as well to come back and win a gold after that long is pretty incredible. Yeah, there are these people that you see on the podium all the time yeah. or in the finals all the time. And then you're not thinking that, okay, this is a special moment for her. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Are there names um, from athletes last season that I should like remember, uh, people that I should keep an eye on this season that might play a dominant role? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting season because it's not like a normal World Cup season because of the Olympics. Yep. So for, for the athletes who have already qualified, for them this season is more about getting a bit of comp experience, you know, settling the nerves. And then we won't see as many athletes competing at all the events like we did last year so it's almost worth keeping an eye on the ones who have qualified for the oqs series uh, who haven't qualified for the olympics yet for them everything is on the line can you say uh, what that is the oqs yeah so it's a two-part series where they give away the last olympic tickets it's the olympic qualifier series yes exactly yep. Yep. yeah so that takes place in china and budapest and i think it's 10 and 10 we're giving away so 10 men and 10 women but don't 
quote me on that because I haven't looked at it recently. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it's kind of the last chance for the athletes to qualify. So people like Adam Ondra, you know, Stasha Gale, for example, you know, they've all qualified for it and they'll be trying to get in. So it's going to be interesting watching those. So there's a list of those people who have qualified on the IFSC website. And for me, they're the ones to keep an eye on because, you know, they'll be using this season in a very different way from the athletes who have already qualified. So I think that's worth bearing in mind for people listening to this, that it's going to feel like a different season. And maybe we won't have the consistency that we saw last year, but it's truly make or break time for so many of them. So it's going to be exciting like that. I'm really fan of the um, World Cup series. And to me, it's a little bit sad that in these Olympic years that the athletes, they don't go to all the competitions. They choose when they need the, the comp training and when not. I just like them being in there all the time. <laughs> yes, I'd agree. But I mean, it's not so different from a normal season. I mean, there's not that many of them who compete for the whole thing. A lot of them drop out of certain events. So it's still going to be the same level of excitement. It's not like we won't see these athletes. I mean, there are, there are so few comps this year anyway that most of them will use the competitions for training purposes. And, you know, winning a World Cup is still an incredible achievement. And in terms of you know, prize money and sponsors and all the rest, you know, it's important that they're still winning. And although the Olympics is the focus, there's, it certainly won't distract from the season. It will still be worth watching. for sure. Mm. And you've just said that Yannick Kruder is not taking part at the competitions anymore, but I think he's still trying to qualify for the Olympics, right? I'm not sure he's in the OQS series. Um, well, there was a list and he was in that list. I'm not sure if... Was he? Are you sure about that? <laughs> I'll have to check it myself. No, I mean, he, he's just an example of someone, you know, who's, who's starting to move away. You know, he's okay. doing more outdoor climbing. He's, of course, he's still competing. He goes to various World Cups, but, you know, he would admit as well, I think, that it's maybe not his 100% focus anymore. But, yeah, obviously, he's still, still a comp legend and kick everyone's ass on the road. Mm. Were there any athletes important to you last season, not only because of their performance in the competition, but because of their personality, their story, their impact on the scene, who are important people besides climbing? I mean, I'm not going to go into favorites because that would be very uh, unprofessional. But I think, I think for me, I, have a, I always have a different perspective on athletes than perhaps people watching because, you know, my job and, you know, in the sense that That is why I have a, usually an athlete or a coach with me is, you know, they are the expert. And, and although I, I can be as knowledgeable or as least knowledgeable as I have to be, depending on the athlete, you know, my job is to create the atmosphere around a competition uh, and not necessarily sort of explain the technicalities to stuff. So I always love it when an athlete displays lots of emotion and personality out on the stage. And, you know, although maybe their coaches are going crazy because the athlete is screaming and shouting and not in their zone or, you know, there's tears on stage or, you know, emotions flying around. For me, that's for me, that's always something that I enjoy seeing because it allows me to talk about something and allows me to see an athlete's heart, if that makes sense. Mm. So I certainly enjoy it when an athlete is uh, shows us everything out on the mats. That's always something that I look out for in terms of personalities of the athletes. It makes my job easier. You know, if someone is, I always respect the athletes who are very in their zone. You know, it's a focus I couldn't have, but I do like it when that zone gets cracked sometimes and we get to see the sort of real feelings that are buried underneath it. No, but you don't want to give us the names because of the reason what you said. Well, I just, I feel like my, my job is to try to stay as fairly neutral as possible. And, and honestly, like, There is no one I want to see lose and there's no one I'd want to see win over somebody else. So. Yeah, it was not just about emotions on the mat, but also like stories of people that you get yeah. to know because you talk to them. Sure. I mean, there's so many. I mean, this, uh, Molly Thompson-Smith, for example, her comeback from injury was pretty spectacular. You know, she, Molly is a, she's a British athlete and she's a true ambassador for the sport. And she's also just an incredible human being and a lovely, lovely person. And she broke her leg, her ankle, horrendously before the season started. So to watch her come back in Salt Lake and to I was gritting my teeth every single time she fell on that leg was, you know, pretty, pretty incredible. I have to respect Brooke Rabatou's guts, full stop. You know, she she won in Hachiochi and it was such an emotional moment. Uh, you know, I was pretty much in tears in the commentary box. And it's just because, again, she had that, you could see everything she was thinking of and then in the world champs she didn't qualify and then someone that wasn't me 
they'd put her on camera and she had to sort of pull herself together and try to do this interview when she hadn't qualified. And to watch her professionalism in that moment it was amazing. So, you know, there's moments where you look at an athlete and you think, wow, you are so much stronger than the average human being. And, and I think that humanity always is incredibly impressive. Um, so, you know, just two examples of, of people who are pretty wonderful. Um, mm. It's things like that, I think, that get me. Um, you know, Yanya coming back from the toe injury. You know, Yanya is someone I have a just... I've known her since she was like 15. And I think what impresses me about Yanya is watching her with the fans. Because I think climbing fans are quite new to the sport and to the athletes. They sometimes mm. get a bit sort of overwhelmed by it all. But she will spend hours signing autographs talking to people you know between quality sessions when most athletes you know will, will not even look at the crowd they don't even want to engage with them Yanya is out there you know she knows that her role is an ambassador as well as being an incredible athlete and her ability to balance those two things is is incredible um to watch so that i have a huge amount of respect for and also speed climbers generally people don't talk about speed climbers enough and Someone like Ola Miroslaw, who is so, so consistent. Um, you know, she hadn't lost a comp since 2013 until the World Championships. And then she slipped and fell. Watching her come back in Rome was, it was a titan performance. It was wonderful. Mm. And she changed her whole personality as well. She went from this athlete who never really engaged with the audience, who was always super focused. She lost at the World Champs. She went away, she reassessed and decided that she wasn't having fun anymore. And she had to refine the fun. And... She came back to Rome and she was a completely different athlete. So I was very impressed with her ability to make that adjustment and to carry it through and then win, you know, and then qualify. It was, it was amazing. Yeah, well, so uh, we were talking about a few events already with these examples. But if, if I told you I had the time to rewatch three events of last season, which ones would you recommend me to see? Ooh, That's a good question. Um, I'd start with Hachiyoji, yeah. um, because there were two interesting things that happened. It was two, you know, winners we didn't necessarily expect. And there was a fascinating bit of setting for the men's competition. So they set a boulder that none of the athletes could figure out. And that was quite interesting because a lot of people sort of complain about setting often. And it's something that I've tried to adjust the way we commentate about because, you know, I've tried to get setters on uh, and they're very usually very unwilling to come on a live stream, but we had Cody, who's very happy to do it, who could kind of explain some of the processes. So, you know, watching a boulder that the athletes didn't know how to do, it was actually a fairly easy boulder. You know, Medjdi did this, it was a sort of a, a jump up into a corner and Medjdi did it in his trainers after the competition, but none of them could figure it out. That was fascinating, you know, literally watching the sport evolve and change in front of our eyes. Yeah, I mean, Laval was a good one, the European qualifier at the end of the season. Uh, that was pretty intense, that entire performance. Um, and then, yeah, I go back to the world champs. I'd watch the speed final, to be honest, okay. because the, the speed final was, was we had a male winner kind of out of nowhere, again, unexpected, and a women's winner, again, completely from nowhere. So in terms of shocks, that was the biggest one in sporting upset. So definitely worth a watch. Okay, thanks for that. <laughs> and um, did you have a favorite moment in the commentary booth? Oh, do I have a favorite moment? I um, can say two moments. <laughs> I think my favorite moment ever, ever in a commentary box was watching, and this isn't from last season, so I'm cheating the question, but mm. there's a speed climber called Daniel Boldyrov, and mm. he was sort of the inspiration for this this Real Rock Ukraine film. And... I commentated on him winning the speed finals at the European Championships in Munich during the first six months of the Ukraine war. And I've never been touched by a moment more. And he won, he climbed back to the top of the wall, he had the Ukraine flag. And I remember realizing that I was about to completely lose it on a microphone. And that my job wasn't to be emotional because if usually if you're emotional, the audience isn't emotional because you're doing the emotion for them. So you need to push down on that. So I was desperately trying to hold this feeling of this wave of just, it was, it was a lot to, to try to handle mm. in that moment. And when that finished, I remember sitting in the stadium completely by myself for almost an hour after it finished, unable to leave because I felt like I'd witnessed something more important than sport. And 
I mean, even talking about it now, I, I slightly get choked up because it it was, you know, there's certain moments in, in sport. I remember there's a, there's a very famous rowing race where um, Steve Redgrave won and you can hear the commentator getting emotional. And I can't help but cry whenever I watch that. And this was back in the 80s, I think. Well, no, not that long ago, but a long time ago. Mm. And for me, that felt like that moment, you know, where I was part of something bigger than just climbing. And uh, that was something I will never, never forget. Yeah, I remember. I watched that too. Mm. Yeah, it was it was special. Yeah. And uh, some more insights uh, to your job. Are there typical things you often have to explain about your job where people have questions or misunderstandings? Um, I think people are unaware of like what we do sort of outside of that commentary box and the amount of sort of extra work that goes into these events because there's a lot of things that we do. There's Eurosport shows that we put together with extra interviews and there's, you know, there's an awful lot of content that gets created. So there's always that side of things. I think people think we just sort of swan around and then turn up and, and speak for, for two hours and then go home. And, you know, the reality is, is we're in there. For example, during a qualifying event, you know, we produce a highlight reel for the qualifying. Um, you know, that's myself and my one of the talented cameramen who works with me. And, and, you know, between the two of us, we put that thing together. And people are always annoyed that we don't cover certain athletes. But imagine trying to, you know, that there's one cameraman and there's maybe 100 athletes. You can't film 100 athletes because you have to film all of their run, especially on a lead competition, because you never know when they're going to fall off or if they're going to qualify or if they're going to win, you know. So the logistics sometimes of producing content that then people complain about is, is quite interesting. And uh, during a semi-final, there's eight athletes on stage. It's very difficult to try to get the exact moment mm. of and capture everything, especially when we're working perhaps with an exterior TV crew who have their own sort of style of doing things. So people are always quite hard on the IFSC and the media team for, for missing stuff when the reality of the sport is it's it's very hard to do it. And we're still a growing sport, you know, we're young and we're, you know, we're fighting to, to get better and better. So that's something that people maybe should bear in mind that uh, no one is deliberately making a mistake. It's mm. just things happen in sport and uh, everyone is trying very, very hard to, to make it as good as possible for people watching. Yeah. Um, let's change a little bit from looking at the last season to looking at this season. We already said, yeah, the Olympic Games will be there this year again. There are some athlete spots still open. There is this Olympic qualifier series in China and Hungary. Um, and then there will be the Olympic Games, of course. But there are still some uh, free spots that will be given to athletes. And I don't know how. <laughs> It's the host country quota and the Universality, Universality places. Yes. What about that? Yeah. So the exact way they give those away is something I also need to get my head around because it is very complicated. Um, but basically, if certain criteria isn't fulfilled, these places get given away. And there's a there's a film actually that I edited that's on the IFSC YouTube channel that looks into the Universality athletes. You know, we followed them for a while last season, and that's worth a watch because there's interviews in that, and you can see some athletes you wouldn't normally see. Uh, and I edited it, so it's obviously brilliant. But it's, uh, so go and ch go and check that out on the IFSC YouTube if you want to know a bit more about that and about the scheme. But yeah, I mean, the basic principle is that the universality allows countries and federations that normally wouldn't have the opportunity to go to a World Cup to compete. So, for example, you know, Iceland and Honduras, you know, the IOC, which is the Olympic Committee, and the IFSC work together to help pay for the travel and accommodation and transport of these athletes so that they can go to a World Cup. And although perhaps the level of these athletes isn't quite as good as some countries, you know, you have to remember that this is countries who maybe have one climbing gym and it's not very good. Mm. And the aim is to try to hopefully introduce climbing to that country and in generations to come that the people see that and say, oh, hang on a sec, I didn't know that this was a thing in my country and I can go and do that. So... I think it's a great program. It's not guaranteed that it will be given to those those athletes. It just depends on certain criteria, but it would be exciting if one of them could get in. I think Svana from Iceland is certainly one to watch because she probably has the best chance of picking out one of those places. Mm. And the host country quota, so that's for people from France. 
How does that work? Well, it's not automatic, but it just means that they have one more place if they qualify to give away. It just allows the host country to have the best chance of being represented in their own Olympic country. Um, mm -hmm. But again, if they don't qualify, they don't get it. So they have to they have to qualify. But there's a whereas the Japan team, for example, is now full uh, filled up. Yeah. You know, France still has a few opportunities there. Okay. Let's talk about the boulder and lead format again. Mm. We have seen this uh, format a few times now. What do you think? How well does it work? How exciting is the format to watch? What is your personal impression? Sure. I, I just want to sort of start this by saying that I think people were never really understood the original Olympic uh, sort of process. I think people thought that the IFSC made a decision to combine them all sort of for fun. Uh, the reality is, is that when a new sport comes into the Olympics, the Olympic Committee does not give away many medals. So some pretty tough decisions had to be made. And, you know, however that decision was going to be made, you were going to annoy some people. And the aim was to grow it because the first time you go into the Olympics, you're not guaranteed. In fact, the second time you go into the Olympics, you're not guaranteed to stay there. You have to prove yourself. And the more you prove yourself and once you get a permanent position, that's when they give you more medals. Because if you think about an event, Every extra day they put into an Olympic Games, for example, is probably millions of pounds in terms of stadiums, in terms of camera people. You know, it's huge. So it's very limited to start off with, which is why that decision was made. It's why the decision continues into uh, Paris. So just to explain that for people who don't get it, you know, that that's why that decision was made. Um, I like the format. You know, I'm very happy that speed is split. Um, and not so much for the lead and boulders, mainly before the speed climbers, because... They are incredible athletes, and I cannot overemphasize this. You know, they train like maniacs. Their mental game has to be so on point, and they were the most disadvantaged in the last Olympics because mm. their specialism isn't lead and boulder. So I'm very excited to see them have their own medals and to really show us what they're made of. So that's exciting. And then in terms of the boulder and lead, yeah, I mean, that, that, the format's been tweaked and there was a lot of complaints about the scoring system last time. And I think that's justified. So this year they've gone away and they've come up with a different one. And I like it, honestly, like it's, it's the most exciting format that I get to talk about because throughout the whole thing, there's something to say. It's very interesting. And athletes have to keep it together throughout the bouldering round. They can't slip too far away. And it, it doesn't feel to me to be too bias towards boulder or lead you know it's quite balanced so i like the format i think it works well i think i think you could debate forever about the intricacies of it but again you know at some point you have to stick with something you have to put it in and you have to you know submit it and so it's what we've got for paris and i think if the world champs and all the continental qualifiers have shown is that that system works you know it works it's exciting it's cool it's fair Can it be improved? Probably. And there are smarter people than me out there who I'm sure are working on that. But we've certainly got something that's better than before that will allow the athletes to really show what they're made of. So I, I think I think it's good. Yeah, I think it's also so complicated to combine two disciplines. Then you have opinions from all sides yes. who say, okay, this is good, this is bad. Can we change this? Can we change that? I watched a little part of the process, uh, watched a, a coach talking to someone from the IFSC yeah. <laughs> saying what he likes or dislikes about the format. And of course, the IFSC person has reasons. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> to do it like this. Yeah. And it's um, yeah, so interesting. It's always a compromise somehow. Yes, it is. And, and there's also a TV aspect, you know, and people might hate that about the sport. And I get that. But it is the reality, which is if it's in the Olympics, it has to work on TV and it has to have a format that's, you know, stays in a certain time and, you know, just isn't indefinite. And there's a lot of things that they have to think about as well as the sport. And If your opinion is that climbing shouldn't be a competitive sport, then you're going to hate me saying that. But it's the reality of any sport that has Olympic aspirations is that you need to make compromises, not only for TV, but for stadiums, for planning. You know, it's hugely in depth. And I don't think people quite realize there's all that that goes on on the on the outside as well. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know anything about how the athletes like this format now? Do you hear anything? I haven't heard any complaints, to be honest. Okay. Um, yeah, I haven't heard anyone hate it. I, I think athletes have got used to doing both sports. Mm. You know, there are very few specialists now. 
And honestly, I actually think that's a good thing, uh, both in terms of training, both in terms of the injury. You know, I think back in the day, boulder problems used to have small holds and be very powerful and lead routes tended to be long in endurancy. And because they've been combined like this, we're seeing lead routes with crazy boulder sections in and, you know, boulder problems that suddenly require insane endurance. And I think that development for the sport is interesting. So again, it's something that I think is actually positive for the sport and you know, of course, there's mutterings from certain people who don't like some rules. And, and you know, there's maybe athletes who will be disadvantaged because you have to do both. But I think generally it's been a good compromise and they're, they're pretty happy with it, from my understanding anyway. Mm. So um, I hope the people are like up to date about the Olympics right now. And I want to look at the also at the World Cup season, of course. And when I did the commentary here in Germany, I remember when the season started, I tried to read everything that is new, for example, changes in the comp climbing rules. Mm -hmm. I tried to get in touch with athletes to know what's going on with them. Is that something you are doing right now too? How do you update yourself? What do you sure. see, hear, read? Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, I'm lucky because I'm now in the sport a bit. So I've got You know, it's not like, so for example, when I started the ice climbing this year, I had to sort of start at the beginning and, mm. you know, get to know the athletes, look back at past seasons, you know, check stats, whereas I have that basis of knowledge with the IFSC. So that's good. You know, always I'll reread the rules. I'll get the updated rules. I'll check things like that. There's things going on this year. Uh, you know, there was a press conference yesterday, in fact, about uh, trying to deal with Red um, S and, you know, that side of things. So things will be a bit different um, in terms of how that's tested. Oh, tell me about that. Yeah. Well, it's, I don't want to go too much into it because I'm not an expert in this, but I think that the issue is incredibly complicated and the system that the IFSC has now put in place is literally groundbreaking. Like there is no other sport that is doing this. We are the first ones to do it. So I think people are quite hard and rightly so, you know, you want, you want the athletes to be protected and you need the sport to be fair. Um, but you know, it's uncharted ground, this and uncharted ground is never easy to get right. But what they've now put in place is, as I said, it, it's groundbreaking and it has experts behind it and it has, it has the potential to make the sport safer for young athletes and old athletes and everyone. And you know, really change the way we're doing that. But it's something, you know, unique. Um, Can you give us details about how they are testing now? And I'm not going to go into details just because it's, again, I'm not the expert on that. And someone who is an expert on that will explain it better than I will. But it's if you take BMI as the, the test that was used last year, and everyone knows how flawed BMI tests are, the new criteria goes way deeper than that. It looks at a whole load of metrics It ensures that the national federations are held responsible for looking after their athletes. And then the IFSC has a robust backup system for that where we can test and make sure that that's being done. Um, and all of this is to keep the athletes safe. Uh, so there's information available if you want to go and check it out. But yeah, if I go into the medical side of it, I would definitely say the wrong thing and I don't want to do that. Oh. Um, and are there any other new things like new and the, the calm climbing rules you you said like in the beginning of our interview that there are some interesting new things you want to talk about <laughs> did i oh gosh uh yeah. i don't remember saying that but um i mean i hope there's nothing too radical uh and to my knowledge there's nothing too radical i don't think um you know i think setting is always is always talked about and you know they, they need to get it right this year and and it's going to be interesting to see the kind of boulders and kind of routes that are created in the build up and lead up to the olympics because for sure you know ideas will be tried and tested during that and as they were last year so that's always interesting to me to see how that goes but yeah there's nothing too radical i don't think uh, i think you were saying that when we are, we were talking about co-commentators and, and about the live stream oh show. i see oh i see like that oh um Well, I don't know. See, this is the thing. I don't know how much I can really reveal. But I mean, I think it's it's pretty safe to say that I, I will be on the mic for the Olympics. Um, oh, cool. And I think some people missed that uh, last year. So um, so I think if you subscribe to Eurosport, you're, you're likely to hear some familiar voices. Ah, great. <laughs> that doesn't give away too much. <laughs> <laughs> 
And um, about the para climbing, I thought last season it was cool to see, for example, at the World Championships that there was a more focus on para climbing. I know um, I talked to someone from the team uh, in Bern. And she said that it was really a plan to pay special attention to paraclimbing. And we also saw it on the live stream you were uh, commentating. Do you see that this will go on like that, that paraclimbing plays a bigger role also in the media coverage? I hope so. Um, it's something that's very important to me. And it was the, probably when I started doing this job a couple of years ago, it was the event that I was most nervous about doing because, you know, my job is to represent the athletes and for me those athletes when they have little funding that it's you know they are dealing with a lot of difficult things anyway uh and then they're doing an incredibly high level of sport and you know i think they are wonderful people and you know i i honestly do my 110 percent to try to show off how good those guys are so i i hope it continues to grow i hope people watch it and i hope people appreciate just how hard it is because you know Go down your local climbing wall and try to climb a sort of a 7C route and then try to climb it with one leg or, you know, no use of your fingers. It's, you know, or blind. You know, it's incredible what they what they go through. And they could kick my ass and anyone else's ass 90% of the time. So if you want to see some incredible athletes, go and check that out. Mm. Um, I was talking to Corinna Wimmer, also uh, here in the podcast, yes. and you were uh, commentating together with her too. Yes, I've done a few with her, yeah. Yeah, and um, she told me, that's interesting, I think, that a lot of her teammates in Germany, they also go bouldering and they uh, see bouldering as their main sport. And some of them wish that there was a para-bouldering format. <laughs> Yes. Do you yeah. know that people are asking for that? Uh, do you know that maybe the IFSC is hearing these things? <laughs> yeah, I mean, for, for sure. I mean, the difficulty is, is trying to make it fair. And, you know, there, there are some impairments that would not be safe to go bouldering. And that's the reality of it. Um, and also, if you try to, you know, safety is obviously paramount and putting people on a rope, you know, although we've had a few accidents along the way with ropes you can control the environment a little more. So yes, I, I think it'd be great to see uh, Boulder for the for the paraclimbers. I just think that it's quite a difficult one to work out how that, both in terms of setting time as well, you know, you have to remember that. Um, because for example, the, the setters have to set routes because there's only so, so amount of wall space available, you know, any competition. And every athlete's got to have two qualifying routes, a semi-final route, you know, sorry, a final route. And that route has to be climbed by sometimes two categories of very different impairments. You know, you might get a visually impaired climber and you might get someone, you know, like a, you know, RP or, you know, who has, uh, you know, lower limb or, or a leg impairment and they have to climb the same route and also the impairments on a different side, you know? So trying to set for that is very difficult. And so logistically adding an entire new format to the sport would be hard to do, but you know, the para, team behind the, the IFSC care a huge amount and I'm sure they'll be looking at all options for sure. Mm. And um, we already talked about athletes and uh, what they did last season, what they will do this season. Are there any more athlete news that might be important this year? I don't think so. Not off the top of my head. There's no sort of shock retirements or like people coming into the sport that I know of. Um, you know, the first comp of the season is always the time where you're like, okay, let's let's see what's going on here. You know, like who's coming. You know, I remember like last year, Serato uh, in Japan, you know, he was 16. He was part of the Japanese squad. And people were like, this kid is incredible. And you're like, mm. yeah, maybe we'll see. You know, he's, he... this is one of the athletes I missed last year. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, he came into Japan and no one really knew who he no. was. And then by the end of it, everyone knows who Serato is. So, yeah. you know, that stuff like that can happen. And, you know, it's not something that I, I, I follow the youth side of things. Obviously, I wasn't in uh, Korea this year. You know, they change things up a little bit. But usually I get to see the youth events. So I sort of spot sometimes when athletes are coming. But you never know how they transition into the senior circuit. It's a whole different world. So it's always worth watching the first couple of comps just to see who's up and coming um, and who the teams bring in, uh, because you might get a Serato who just suddenly changes the game. Uh, mm. You know, so that's always exciting. Okay, so then what are you personally looking forward to? Like people, any places? Um, I mean, there's a few missing this year that are shown. Like I love to go to Japan, for example. 
which is not on the calendar this year. Uh, sort of the classics are there. You know, Innsbruck will always be spectacular. Innsbruck always is. You know, I, I live in Chamonix in France, so the Chamonix comp is quite special to me. And I get to sleep in my own bed, which is nice. Mm. But honestly, like, I'm just excited to get going. Like, I'm not very good at sitting around. And this is my off season right now, you know, apart from the UIA stuff. So I'm looking forward to getting back on the road, back into that routine uh, and back into that just madness that is the World Cup circuit. So I, I kind of can't wait to get cracking, really. It's going to be it's going to be brilliant. And hopefully people can join me. And also I'm doing I'm doing a, a lot more with the IFSC this year. So I'm sort of slightly transitioning into a role where I help produce and create content for them. So I'll be working four times as much with the IFSC. And the plan is that I will be making extra videos for the YouTube channel. You know, I'll be staying after comps and creating stuff because, you know, I, I film and I edit as well as I speak. And, mm -hmm. you know, the goal is to try to create more content that is free for people to watch, you know, because I'm aware that, you know, it moved into a paying platform to watch these competitions. Um, and obviously we want to bring value to people and hopefully I'll be a part of trying to do that and allow you to see athletes from different angles that you haven't seen them before. That's, that's the goal. Okay, cool. So I just have one last question from a listener. Sure. He asked, when will the IFSC start streaming the qualies? <laughs> Maybe just the <laughs> video, no comments if that is too much. Okay, well, okay, this is a very reasonable point. Um, you have to remember a couple of things. Number one, the qualies go on all day. So they start at about eight o'clock in the morning, and sometimes they finish at five o'clock at night. You know, that's standard. So it's a huge event. You've got 100 or so, 120, 130 athletes coming through which is a, an awful lot to try to film, full stop. So in terms of putting together a full broadcast for that, that would be very challenging to do. You know, it's, I, I don't know how you would do that just logistically. And, you know, people say, oh, just put up a static camera. Okay, you do that, but then you know what it's like. There will be the complaints. No details. You know, people will appreciate it. And then, yes, exactly. People will be like, this is terrible. This is bad. This is bad. So, you know, the question becomes is, do you do something badly or do you do it well you know and as i said at the beginning it's a sport that's still limited by resources you know if we had billions of pounds i'm sure we could maybe work something out we don't you know and we're trying to build this sport up as well so if someone can tell me how we film a qualis <laughs> i would i would be very interested if i can pass it on but just logistically it's a very difficult thing to do when you yeah. have that many athletes that many but i mean innsbruck for example it takes place on two sides of the arena you know, you'd have to double the amount of cameras and camera team just to just to statically film that one. And then you wouldn't have any details. So, you know, there's a reality to it. Uh, and we, we've started to film the speed qualities, for example. And that is, you know, that's quite a short event because it goes quickly. But that's an entire extra day of work for the teams. But, you know, the reason we did that is because so many world records kept going down in qualities that we felt it was important to show it. So we're trying, but just people need to be aware of the, the actual logistics of that one. Mm. Yeah, and I remember, it, I don't know which World Cup it was, the team from from the World Cup decided to just put up a camera. It, it was yeah, Meiring, or I don't know, for the qualies. Yeah. And I tried to watch it and I put it on a very big screen in my living room and still it was nothing that I enjoyed watching. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, you, you can't, you know, everything you put up, you know, we want to have a quality. So, and, you know, every camera requires a camera operator and it requires someone to select the shots and to do that whole thing, you know. So it, it, you're basically talking about like a 12 hour broadcast. Oh. And I'm not sure people would necessarily watch that anyway, even though they say they do. I'm not oh. sure, I'm not convinced. But like when I have the chance to go to a World Cup personally, I watch the qualities. It's really cool to do that. Yeah. When you're really there. Absolutely. So it's not like, qualities are not interesting <laughs> no they're fascinating they're just massively long yeah you know, it's it's yeah. that's the reality they go on all day um, yeah that's crazy you know how do you film that mm. so yeah so i tell you what if you want to go and see it go and watch it in person because often these events are free you know and especially qualities are usually free so you know and i know people it's hard to travel to but if you want to go and witness it it's a great day to go and see it because it's a free event usually and you get to see the world's best you get to go up close and personal with them and you get to see so much more climbing than a semi-final or a final you know you get to see everything so yeah go and go and watch it yeah all right mad i thank you very much 
course, no worries at all. Thank you for speaking. And um, what will be the first event where we can see you? Like, do you go to Studio Block or something? Um, in terms of the sort of pre-comp game, it's been a bit compromised this year for me just because of this ice season. So normally, for example, I would have done Doc Masters last weekend or two weeks ago, but I was at Sasfe doing the ice climbing. Um, so the first comp I'm doing is Plywood Masters in the UK. That's on the first and second, sorry, second and third of March. And then pretty much I'm, I'm straight into it in China. So mm. China, beginning of April from, I think, I mean, I fly on something like the 6th or 7th. And then the competition, I think, starts on the 8th. And yeah, it's a double header and it's going to be incredible. Good. So, yeah, I'm excited to see you, to see the new season. And uh, thank you very much. No worries. Thank you for having me. That was my interview with Matt Groom. Thank you, Matt, for taking the time. And now I am looking forward to watching some cool moves in the new IFSC World Cup season. I hope you enjoyed this talk and I'd be happy if you shared the podcast with your climbing buddies. That's it for this episode. Juliana, mein Name, und ich bin Vic Bouldern. <laughs> <laughs>